joining us this morning. Um, I know some of you are up pretty early, those of you that are on the West Coast, and we do appreciate you accommodating us and getting up early to join us. Um, I'm Amy Ellis. I know most of you know me, but for anyone that doesn't, I work in the National Office in Fredericksburg and um, appreciate everyone being here. I wanted to um, take a minute to go over some ground rules and housekeeping with everyone. Um, we would like to ask you to stick to positive feedback and constructive comments only. Um, we would like to allow one to three minutes for discussion points for people and um, please be respectful of ideas and recommendations. And then the few housekeeping, uh, oh and one other thing, um, if everyone could go into their um, name on your picture and please rename yourself with your ACA affiliation if you're already associated with a state um, executive Council or if you um, aren't already associated with a state exec executive council you know just if you have an association with a group a particular group or you know just any state that you live you know if you live in want to put your the state you live in that would be great too um, just so we know who who is here and where you're from um, and then our housekeeping items, um, please mute your camera and microphone if you're not speaking. And we do have the chat function enabled, so um, please use that. And then we are scheduled until 1145 Eastern so that you can get a break before the membership meeting and the awards today. And Amy, if I could just say a few things. Um, Absolutely. I'm going to drop off so that I, I don't put a damper on any conversation, but I just want to thank all of you for all the work that you do on behalf of the ACA. We really appreciate it. We, you know, quite honestly feel kind of bad that we have not been able to provide more support to the state director program over the past couple of years. Um, and that's been really a result of, you know, just not having a lot of bandwidth um, from the staff perspective. Um, Amy wears about three hats or four hats already. And um, it's just, you know, it's just been really hard for her and for us as a whole to devote as much time and money and effort as we would like. So we just want to start out by saying that and, and again, thanking all of you for everything that you do to help support the ACA and the paddling community. So thank you very much. Thank you to Andrea and Andrea um, for uh, working really hard to get this uh, meeting set up. As you all know, they are volunteers just like you guys and um, they put a lot of a time and effort into, um, you know, trying to figure out how to make this a productive and helpful session for everyone. So thank you both. And um, with that, I will um, say see you at 12 if you can come to the uh, membership meeting. We would love to see you there. Um, thank you for attending the conference. And as I said at the beginning, many of you have been speakers and have helped with other sessions. So we thank you very much for that as well. Yeah. So I hope you all have a great hour and 15 minutes or hour and a half or hour and 45 minutes. And um, I will look forward to hearing what you all come up with. So thank you. Hey, and Beth, thank you for making time in the conference for us to do this. I appreciate the slot. Oh, yeah. of course. This is important. All right. See you guys later. Thanks. Thanks, Beth. Okay. Um, and so um, moving on, I wanted to, um, you know, you guys are hearing the names Andrea and Andrea, and you're probably wondering, some of you know them, uh, probably many of you know them, but for anyone that doesn't, let me take a moment to introduce the two of them. They are the ones that, that came to us and said, you know, we really think that the state director program is very important and we want to continue and, and get this group of wonderful volunteers together. And so, um, they deserve a lot of credit. And um, so let me tell you about these two wonderful women. So Andrea Valancourt Alder, or AVA for short, um, has been serving the ACA New York State Executive Council for close to four years. Having dual citizenship with the UK, AVA is both an ACA instructor and British canoeing 
coach since 2000. She has been teaching on the water since the early 80s. She's passionate about creative collaborations that provide accessible paddling opportunities. She's also committed to developing sustain sustainable initiatives that grow the industry with safety of the community at its core. And then Andrea White, also known as Andrea from Tennessee, is a native of Nashville, and she's been um, the ACA Tennessee State Director for two years. She came up through the ranks as a board member and river kayak kayaking instructor at her home club, the Tennessee Scenic Rivers Association, and has a particular passion for finding ways to bring safety and rescue training to the growing population of casual paddlers in Middle Tennessee. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea. Thanks you guys, really appreciate the slot. Um, Y'all, everybody, thank you for coming this morning. I know it's really early for a lot of folks. We've, we've expressed in the state directors group and in other forum um, that it's been a frustrating year. And I mean, COVID is frustrating enough, but it's just kind of been frustrating and that we didn't feel like we had some cohesion among state directors. Um, and I think that it's, 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 we're at a point where we can acknowledge that, you know, the, the leadership transition at the high level meant that Beth and the team, the seven folks in an office in Fredericksburg, you know, they kind of had to focus on getting the house in order and, and shoring up the, the foundation. And that's where, where their energy should have been spent. I, I can be frustrated all I want, but that was really the right priority. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a state director's program. That doesn't mean that at all. Um, I got to tell you, nobody, nobody had to give, give any of us permission to lead. We were elected by the paddlers in our state to lead. Uh, and there are rivers and there are paddlers and there are clubs and we know where the safety issues are. We know what the, where the problems are and we can lead. We can do something about it. And a lot of you guys have been. Um, and the problem is that we haven't been talking to each other. So what this morning is about is not so much solving all of the problems of the state director program in an hour. We're not going to do that. The, what this is about is let's talk to each other. Let's talk about what we're doing. Let's talk about what we could do. Um, and let's figure out what the right structure is for us to go forward and be a cohesive state directors program. Because, you know, honestly, I'm not worried if what we need to do is support each other in this endeavor. Um, I'm not worried about, you know, Amy, no, no offense to you or Carrie, I'm not worried about whether one of the seven people in an office in Fredericksburg is supporting what we're doing. We can support each other. We've got the skills. We know how to do this. Uh, we're instructors and we're advocates and we, we do media. And I mean, I, I, I looked at that survey. I know you guys got skills. So, so we can support each other and we can do this. And we just have to decide what structure we want to use to do it. Um, you know, seven people in an office in Fredericksburg is not the ACA. We are the ACA. We are the ACA. The paddlers are the ACA. The instructors are the ACA. It's a member-driven organization. So let's drive. And that's what I'm about. So here's my plan. Um, if I can get my screen to, there we go. Um, my plan basically is to spend from now until about 11 o'clock Eastern. Um, we're going to do some real high level stuff where I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've done in Tennessee. Andrea is going to talk a little bit of what she's done in New York. Robert from New Mexico reached out to me. He's going to talk a little bit about what he's done in New Mexico. We'll cover some of this stuff from the survey and talk a little bit about what we've done in our states, right? I want to kind of cover all of that between now and 11. So it's got to stay real high level. And I say that to warn myself as much as anybody, because this is stuff I've spent countless hours on and I can talk about for any amount of time. So all of us need to be very disciplined to stay real high level in this first part of the meeting, right? Because from 11 until 1145, I want us to talk about the go forward plan. I want us to talk about what it's going to look like as we gather next time. Ideally, I'm hoping we're gonna finish this session by deciding we're gonna have another Zoom meeting among the state directors between now and Christmas. And at that meeting, we will formalize the structure and we will formalize the plan. Uh, and between now and then, we can have any number of conversations by uh, the, uh, the state directors. Somebody is not muted. Okay, that's better, thank you. Um, so, so that's the plan, so let's get started. I'm gonna stay real high level, y'all. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the Tennessee initiatives. We started with a strategic foundation. I'm trying to get some of this. There we go. Um, and by building the foundation of how we talk to each other as paddling leaders across the state, we built a foundation for whatever came next. Uh, we had a galvanizing issue because we had regulation coming down the pike at the state level at state government. 
uh, from the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, uh, a bill that was initially targeted at private paddlers uh, as a way to get us to all pay every year to register our boats like powerboat people do. Uh, that morphed into their fallback plan, which was to get regulatory authority over the flat water outfitters. They did get the whitewater outfitters exempted since they were following, um, they were mostly regulated by the feds already on, on US Forest Service rivers. Um, but all in all, it's regulation and it's paddlers and we were the initial target and that has galvanized the leaders of our state to want to talk to each other and join forces. Um, the way that we did that, I created a Facebook group called the ACA Tennessee Presidents Forum that includes um, leaders, probably about you know, six people roughly, from the boards of the five uh, Paddle America clubs in the state. Um, so that you've got a past president, a current president, and a future president, so to speak, right? You've got about six people from each board. Um, and no matter who is a frequent Facebook user or an infrequent Facebook user, somebody from every club is up to speed on what we're posting and talking about in that group at all times. Having that leadership forum gave us a solid foundation to start. That started the conversation. Then we had a meeting. This was October of 2019. This is just a couple little screenshots from our Facebook Live. Um, where we had three of the five presidents and representatives of every board at the same place, at the same time, we paddled together, we ate together, and we had a business meeting together where we talked about ways we could join forces on public policy and stewardship issues. Um, most of these clubs have been around for more than 50 years, and as far as we can tell, this is the first time leaders from all five clubs have been together in the same place at the same time. It's a pretty mon monumental thing, and it became really important because not only did we start by joining forces on some public policy and stewardship initiatives. Um, but when COVID hit, we already had those relationships to lean on each other. So we started by um, the low hanging fruit for a stewardship initiative that we could all join forces on was American Whitewater had already started the legwork to get the Nolichucky River declared a wild and scenic river. And we, and we all signed on. And we didn't just sign on, we got our members to like all sign on and, and show statewide support for this, this river that's up in the upper very northeast corner of a 10 hour long state. And it's got paddlers from Memphis signing on. It's got businesses from Memphis signing on. So we were able to show statewide support for a river in a very, you know, a, a far distant corner of the state. Um, we have been working with the 10 Green Land Conservancy uh, which does a lot of big donor events to buy land uh, for conservation purposes that ultimately often ends up being donated to state parks or state uh, wild, wildlife resource area. Um, and what we're going to do with them, COVID sort of interrupted us a little bit, you know how that goes. Uh, but what we're going to do with them is we're going to provide paddling leaders that are instructors that are safe, that are rescue instructors or paddling instructors that can provide safety, be safe boaters, but also help give those donors a phenomenal experience going down the Tennessee waterway and explain why these rivers and these, and these waterways are so important to conserve um, and really build those relationships between paddling leaders in the state and the, the, the land conservancy functions. Uh, and then when a bill came down the pike this year, and the, obviously there were so many other things that were important legislatively, but this bill came down the pike to get uh, the Piney River declared a state scenic river. And in about, you know, I think there was a three day turnaround. I was able to get letters of support from all across the state, from the paddling clubs all across the state to get this river uh, protected uh, because we already had those relationships and those shared values. When COVID hit, um, we had to get real tactical real fast, but, but it never occurred to me not to lean on those relationships, y'all, because we had already built that foundation, that strategic foundation. So we did two Facebook Live panels, uh, one on April 1st and one on May 7th, where we had uh, thought leadership panels talking about what this meant in terms of recreating responsibly and paddling during a pandemic. Um, we got thousands and thousands and thousands of eyeballs on these. It was a real community building experience at a time when everybody was staying home. And it was, a, it was important for our community to be able to come together and think uh, responsibly and to be able to share some leadership for that. Uh, and that was one way that, that by having that foundation already set, we were able to move into action very quickly. We ended up doing seven online training sessions for free by a Facebook Live between April and June. Um, uh, all of this was, you know, we're trying to get paddlers to stay closer to home. We're trying to, to build our community and have people not feel so alone, have a place where they can come together. 
and we did it online. We, um, I want to give special shout out to Scott Fisher at the Knowledge Hockey Outdoor Learning Institute and his instructors, Debbie uh, and Joy. I want to give a special shout out to Eric Burnett at TVCC. Um, we did a leave no trace session. We did first aid. Uh, we did so you want to get into flat water paddling. Uh, we even did a backpacking 101. Um, and then Scott did a, a swift water rescue series where he did a night on knots and night on anchors and a night on mechanical advantage. Uh, it, it, you know, in the long run, does it change the world? Maybe not, but a bunch of people learned some skills and came together in community at a time when we needed to be able to come together. Uh, and then once ACA published that COVID document about the teaching guidance, uh, within 48 hours, we had a Zoom call with leaders from all five clubs and Trey Knight from the SEIC Council, where we went through it together. We went through all those requirements together and we compared notes. We compared notes on uh, how we had just lost the ability to teach on the U.S. Forest Service rivers and our river permits were now inactive until we filed the risk mitigation plan. Um, Scott Fisher had already written one for, for you know, a more uh, exacting jurisdiction of the U.S. Forest Service. And so we knew that our jurisdiction of the U.S. Forest Service would probably, you know, accept the, the, the one that the more exacting district had already accepted. Um, Scott made that available to Mike Schillinger from TDCC. They adapted it for club use. Mike made it available to the rest of the clubs. I got to tell you guys, part of the reason that we got back up to speed with swift water rescue classes so quickly is that we joined forces. I mean, Rescue Randy went on tour. He went to several clubs. Um, and the, we had one president in that meeting that said, look, I need you guys to support me. We've got to all join forces that whatever events we do this summer, we got to require a mask on land. You know, reasonable people can disagree about what the right thing is to do on water, but on land, we got to require a mask and we all got to stand unified. And the other presidents all agree. Um, and some clubs, you know, got up to speed in, in a more robust way than others. Um, but if we had not had that foundation to have that meeting, to have that conversation, I don't know how much we would have gotten done this year. I think that that was, that was a, a factor that brought everybody together in a really good way. And you can do that in every state. Every state could do this with your, with your stakeholders and your group. Now I'm going to jump, jump topics a little bit because I'm going to shift from COVID, which, you know, was a very, is, is a very recent and ongoing thing to the more bigger picture training initiatives, right? So as I was coming up through the ranks at TSRA, my claim to fame is that I helped co-found a class called Rescue for Rec Voters, and I'm very passionate about it, and I'm not going to go into the detail now. But we started local in 2016. It's a two-day class that offers entry-level boaters, casual paddlers, recreational paddlers, one day of lake training and one day of river training on a class one river. Um, it was wildly successful, sold out for the first two years, had to add extra classes. Um, and from that, we built on that success. We put a little video together for Robin Pope in 2019 talking about all the successes. I even got TWRA to help me put the video together. I uh, got a guy I worked with before and relationships we've built over the course of these two years working on all these on these policy issues. Um, and off the side of his desk, he helped me put this little video together for, for Robin to work with the Coast Guard on about ways that we could do hands on training for entry level paddlers at the ACA. Um, then COVID hits, right? So things all of a sudden change. Um, but what we were able to do in 2020 was continue building the infrastructure for that program. Uh, I worked with leaders from the clubs across the state. We got some scholarship money for people to, to pursue some uh, ACA uh, instructor certifications. And we got six new L2 and L3 rescue instructors. That's notable because typically people go for the L3, L4, right? Typically people are targeting a higher level cert because they wanna train the higher level boaters and the first responders. Our audience right now is not the higher level boaters. Our audience is class one paddlers. So we need rescue instructors who want to go teach on class one waterways, but have the skills in their toolbox that come from being a certified rescue instructor. Um, and we got Scott Fisher certified as a new rescue IT, so we can continue this program year after year and build that infrastructure to continue training these entry level boaters. Uh, I come from a marketing and PR background, so I, I'm big to jump on an opportunity for tactical publicity. Uh, when we did that, that class in June, uh, just as the world was opening back up and we were trying to, to you know, give a safety message out and talk about the importance of safety on the waterways as everybody's flooding the waterways, 
Um, I used it as an opportunity to get some tactical publicity around our rescue instructor class. I had the chairman of the board there because Robin was the ITE for Scott becoming an IT. Um, between having rescue, uh, instructor candidates from all across the state and having the chairman of the board there, I was able to get some tactical publicity around this safety message. Um, we got the local TV station and the local newspaper, but even more than that, six hours away, the biggest daily newspaper in the state covered us and made us the big water safety story for, for Fourth of July weekend. Um, so we were able to transfer, translate an instructor certification class into media about the importance of safety training that hit five different media outlets. Um, in September, I did a similar thing. Um, Scott at, at Noachucky Outdoor Learning Institute uh, partnered with Team River Runner and brought in rescue instructor, uh, rescue candidate, I'm sorry, <laughs> brought in Swiftwater Rescue uh, candidates from four states from the Team River Runner program. And we were able to get a ton of media for them. I mean, it's such a heartwarming story being able to, to, to talk about what Team River Runner does, as we all know. Um, but personally, I'm excited I got a front page in a local paper that's got photos, big, colorful photos of swift water rescue drills that's happening on the front page of a newspaper, right? We're also on local TV. We also made the Tennessean six hours away. Um, we got, because it was there, this, is, this veteran story and Scott's a veteran and he used to serve at Fort Campbell and we had a couple of veterans from Clarksville. We actually got coverage in the Clarksville paper, which is about five hours away. Uh, they got reprinted in the Tennessean. Um, it's, you got tactical publicity opportunities around every initiative you guys are doing. Um, and we can join forces on that. And then here in September, October, we had a sort of an unfortunate incident, but it, it kind of turned out and, and yeah, I'm gonna cast it in a positive light in the end. Um, at the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which is has the number one park, national park in the country for visitors. It's, it has the most visitors of any national park in the country. Uh, for the last five years, um, there has been a, a park uh, superintendent who is a real up and comer in the National Park Service. Um, and he is an African American and they thought very highly of the, the National Park Service. He was thought very highly of at the US Forest Service before they stole him away. Um, and we had a situation here where someone left a black bear skin over a park entrance sign that said, from here to the lake, black lives don't matter. Now that's obviously ugly and awful. What I'm happy to be able to tell you is that within three days, three days, mind you, three days, 53 different regional organizations had signed onto a letter condemning this act. And if they had waited five days, I guarantee you it would have been three times that many. Uh, it was not a problem getting people to sign onto this letter. People were universally uh, condemnatory, that's probably not a word, but you get what I mean, uh, of this act and wanted to be supportive of our park superintendent and our park and every, everyone else that visits that park and works at that park and, and all of the parks. Um, this, it, for me, is not about uh, giving credit to the people who did the right thing, because obviously they did the right thing, and that's what you're supposed to do when you go through life. You're supposed to do the right thing, and, and they did the right thing. What, for me, what it's about is that because we were already engaged with all these organizations on stewardship issues, on public policy issues, um, on issues that, that relate to our waterways in other ways, we were part of, they, they contacted us. We were in the mix. We were already part of the conversation and we were included in this, in this initiative because we were already in the conversation. We were politically relevant. Um, and if you guys go ahead and get in the conversation, then you'll be politically relevant when something happens and you can take part and you can do the right thing. So that's my high level of what's happened in Tennessee. Um, Andrea, please take over the screen and take over the, the presentation and talk about New York for a while. Okay, we're unmuted. Sorry, folks, bear with me. I'm new to the Zoom. I'm gonna just share the screen. Uh, okay, continue, where is it? Um, here we go. Okay, so. Can everybody see that? Okay, is it come up on the screens? Okay, welcome to Buffalo, everybody. On the left, we have a picture of our busy Buffalo River. 
you can see multi-use there, a lot of things happening. We are fortunate that Cheerios are made here and you can get these wonderful smells on the river. And this time of year, it's probably Count Chocula. So a lot of fun. And on the right is a typical scene on Lake Erie. And this is actually one of our hot spots. So um, a beautiful sheltered creek and then it opens up out onto the lake. So we're here today because my term time is up. I'm finishing my second term and we really wanted to share our, our story here in New York and how we drove it. And there's some, there's some meaty information here. And much like Andrew, we could talk about every page for hours and days. So we're gonna try and keep this tight to time. But what these pictures are not showing is that on the left, conditions picked up. There were five rescues and on the right on Lake Erie there were three rescues on those very same days so we'll come back to that because there might be an opportunity for us all to work together to drive a national safety initiative so just to put everybody just to, to give a little bit of background here my role in the UK was working in multi-agency partnerships working with the hardest to reach communities. I like to refer to them as hardly reached because we can reach everybody if we work with the right folks. So it was a massive collaboration. It was, um, it was, it was very wonderful. Learned a lot of things and continued to learn by working in partnership and collaborating. So in 2013, I came back, uh, started meeting local paddlers, very excited about that, and joined the ACA in 2014. So here's where our story really begins. Uh, the marina down the road from my house right here on the lake, we had a fisherman go out, an angler was out, it was October, November, beautiful day, stunning, stunning day, but water was very cold. That individual did not return to land and did have a PFD, but unfortunately hypothermia, not the right clothes. So the second one was on one of my teaching patches. The first was on a training ground for me where I, I train. And then the other was one of my favorite spots right next to the Indian reservation, uh, Seneca Nation here. And there were four lads who went out, great day, conditions change. They do very quickly here on Lake Erie. Three landed after coming out of their boats. And unfortunately, the three witnessed their friend drowning, trying to put his life jacket on. He was seen trying to slip it up over his arm and drowned right in front of him. Well, the first incident led to a meeting down in Albany. And just for people who may not be aware, we are a lot closer to Canada. I can paddle to Canada down the end of the road. It's 20 minutes across the bridge. Albany's five hours away, but I drove down and met with the DEC and New York State Parks. What can we do here, folks? Because it seemed to be quite an issue without the jackets. And that led to a collaboration, a wonderful collaboration. And after the second one, the banner that you see on the sign and behind me here, wear it <clears throat> because somebody loves you. Ro Woodard, if you're out there, thank you. Because she was a huge support for us. And she produced the banners down in Albany and sent them up. And not just one, we got a whole bunch. And the picture below shows one of our outfitters, one of our rental agencies, I should say, not an outfit. They rent kayaks. They are the face of the industry here. This was the first company to set up. And so they, the, the sign is out there. It's a public service message we're trying to get out. And so then in 2016, Mike, thank you, Mike, he's on here today. He approached me about joining uh, the committee and to focus on Buffalo's waterways. We have some great challenges here. So not gonna go through everything here, but I'm gonna pull out a couple of things, but I know that a lot of you are doing very similar activities and we thank you for that because this is a, a combined effort as we try and address some of our challenges. So I'll pull out a couple of things. The first one, Cabela's and Dix called, said, hey, can you come work our boat show? Well, I was curious, I had to ask, why me? And the response from both managers was, well, we think you know more about paddling than our staff. Well, that was quite informative, and that led to a conversation with Mike that the former leaders of the ACA I hope were a part of to see maybe we need to develop a program because they truly are the face of our industry now. And um, so that's, I'm just planting that seed right there. We reached out to all the instructors, but a big thing for us is accessible training and opportunities. And that came up a number of times in the um, the session yesterday, training uh, opportunities. There are so many barriers to for paddlers and people who want to paddle. 
So we worked locally with our charities, our not-for-profits, and we were successful in some funding that cut the cost of the adaptive paddling workshop. So finding opportunities, make it work, make it affordable for people, and then sustain that interest. And if you look down at the picture, we were doing rescue demos, the bottom photograph for the big event up on the top. I'm sorry, my, my contractors are going in and that's my alarm. So uh, this is a training opportunity for a couple of meetup leaders. Now, a lot of people here, luckily, there isn't the cash to go and have instruction. There aren't so many opportunities. So by involving them in our demonstration, there was some learning that occurred. And, uh, and that's wonderful. And the police behind were all, were all part of it. Now, our safety events seem to be a really phenomenal way to make an impact. We did rescue roadshows to start at hot spots. Seabirds was fortunate to get a safer boating grant that funded all these signs. Um, and we were then able to share those out with our outfitters and at our hot spots. And one of the most interesting things at our demos is that we had our auxiliary coast guard, Oxpad uh, volunteer Kevin uh, assisting. We went to a very busy launch site on the river. And as paddlers were launching, I asked if I could just borrow their wreck boat. Hey, do you mind, can I just show you something? I took off my life jacket, got in their boat, paddled out and capsized. Did this a number of times. And what the Coast Guard, what Kevin counted, was the amount of people who came back to land, went back to their cars and put their life jackets on. So the value of demos is huge. Demonstrate as much as you can. And uh, 20 people put their life jackets on. Those were 20 people that were about to hit this river without a life jacket on. So I thought it was a good success. And, um, and I would love to hear from all of you and, and, and your ideas, which I know we'll get to later. So outreach to the future, what are we doing? Well. All our incidents, we had to get everybody around the table. So in 2018, a water safety consortium was established with all our partners. And this was hosted and housed by Buffalo Waterkeepers. Waterkeepers are throughout the country. They do an amazing job here. And we shared best practice, worked on resources. And there's a link in the presentation, which I believe Kelsey or Amy have put up for you to show their safety page. This is something we can all do. If you have people and organizations out there who might be working with other people you haven't reached yet, build a program there. Um, and this year, with the pandemic and the incidents that happened from the very first slide, we have now set up a waterfront safety Facebook group that is managed by our rescue services, Ron from the Hamburg Water Safety. Because we have large ships coming in, we have a number of newbie paddlers out there who are not aware that you are not supposed to paddle up and touch the back of the boat with the thrusters on. So our captains, our trip boat leaders, they are gathering evidence for us. We have photographs of people in wreck boats, no jackets, beer in hand, trying to do that. Many of you are aware that being by those thrusters could actually end up with a real bad outcome. So we're doing what we can and it's about communication. This year we're looking, we are developing multi-agency training and training with mannequins. So we have an event in February, ice training, kayaks, mannequins, all our, our team there. And then we're building to a wonderful event in May at the start of Safer Boating Week. And this is something I think we can all get involved with. So what is our challenge? Why are we here? What's our motivation? Many of you have seen the Coast Guard report. There's also a link in the presentation so that you can go directly to it. We know that the numbers are much, much higher. We just haven't calculated. Think about those communities who maybe haven't been a part. We know they do not have access to quality training or opportunities when they're buying their boats. The hang tags, the, the, the AC leaflets should be in all the big box stores because again, the face of the industry. And we found it quite interesting and informative at the SCIC meeting. Coast Guard reported there were 16 million registered motorboaters. Now those folks are paying to get their license and there's a huge incentive. They do the class, it's reduced. That doesn't apply to paddlers. I'm not sure how many $150 boats are registered. They might fall under homeowner's insurance. But the money from the licensing is now funding, working with 33 million self-propelled, of which I think 13 million are paddlers not associated with ACA. So we've been focusing on trying to bring those folks in. Locally, the cost of that for just three of our agencies, and that's the uh, Coast Guard here, our Buffalo Police Underwater Recovery Unit, and the Hamburg Water Patrol. In the last three years, there were 77 rescues, 
77 paddlers were pulled from the water here in Buffalo to the tune of just under $500,000. So who's paying for that, right? And where's the challenge coming from? And that's just under seven grand per paddler. And as the economy changes, I don't think anybody would want our friends to be slapped with that ticket. But the cost is not complete yet. That does not include volunteer time for the services. That does not include the other agencies that we are working with. And the graph on the right, that shows the jump in rescues. Obviously this year it's getting a little bit, um, well, it's much, much higher. And this does not include, we're still gathering our evidence and this is not, unfortunately, it doesn't have the outfitters rescues. I'm aware of 15. On the dock side, uh, there's a lot of alcohol on our kayaks uh, activity, a lot of people drinking, and that's perhaps contributing to some of the rescues. This does not include paddlers rescuing other paddlers, the dog walkers out there doing land shore rescues. So we have a piece of work we're doing behind the scenes trying to gather that evidence that will help with our proposed funding bid. So the point of all this is, folks, 39 billion, possibly more, came in to the big box stores in the first three months of COVID. Billions of dollars. It'd be wonderful if that funding could be redirected and we get a percentage, 10%, typically any project, any big funds, we can get 10% to build a very robust safety education program for all those people who are not, all those paddlers we want to engage with. And it would mean free for them funding to pay for, for instructors and time and provide new opportunities. So, so really want to think about that a little bit more. And how are we delivering this? That came up yesterday. Well, what, what's the formula? What do we do? So for us, collaboration, working partnerships, this is essential. Building relationships, maintaining relationships, agreeing on a shared vision and focusing on that. And community education program ideas, as we said, Mike and I really trying to get this thing going in the big box stores, national safety events. We could all jump on Safer Boating Week, run something same day, flood social media and the news with it. Our media campaign here started in 2017. We have an excellent relationship with the press. We've had a lot of live coverage. You can Google all that, um, it's out there. But how do we deliver folks? And the delivery mechanisms are you our members, all about you. So I'd like to set a challenge now. We've got these signs, there was a link to Safer Boating, five bucks you can buy and put them on your cars. But why not, over the weekend, get your markers out and paper, make your own wear it sign, stick it on your car every time you're out there paddling. Just subliminal messaging, thank people for wearing their life jackets. That's what we do now, it kind of works. A group of people, one's got a jacket, hey, thank you so much for wearing that. And it has a positive impact. So members, we need to hear from you. We want to involve you and help us. It'd be great. New communities and partners. Obviously, ACA has, has, we have our instructors, our ITs, our ITEs, the clubs, the directors. Wonderful if we could have a small grant scheme coming through the director program. And many, many more of the hardly reached people can help. So looking at the picture on the right, Seneca Nation, we have a wonderful relationship with them. They're very close here. We work in their community center and we are able, we have a, a, an agreement, we can run courses there. And then when they have events, we come in. And in this particular event, they had tribes from all over the country come. It was a water safety initiative. They wanted to clean up their, their rivers and creeks. So I sat on the table for an hour with my life jacket on and we paddle talked and it was amazing. Again, I learned a lot and those figures, their incidents, their rescues, their recoveries, they are not being captured. So in my day job, I work with the developmentally disabled and we help them find their independence and we help them have their voice heard. And I just planting a seed before we get to our, our last slide here is that even our nonverbal individuals have the ability to have their voice heard. So all of you members, it's time to be heard. And just to wrap up, first of all, thank you to all our amazing volunteers in Buffalo. None of this would happen without you. We're reaching 2,500 paddlers a year. Our season is four months for our recreational boaters. Others paddle year round, except for when the lakes are open. So what we can do, we can develop new partnerships, collaborate, reach new paddlers, Consider incentives to participation. What's going to get people there? What's the hook? Come, oh, go do a safety class. Why would I? I don't need that. So think about this thing. Choose a hotspot or three for public messaging. 
signs on the cars, really easy, quick fix. Deliver a free safety day. We're encouraging everyone to join us on that day. And participate in learning, folks. So British Canoeing Paddles Up is an excellent, they've worked so hard the last couple of decades to become more accessible. So what we like to do is share best practice. There's an opportunity for free training online to build your professional skills as a paddle sports instructor. If you're a member and you're paddling, you're not sure, check it out. Other opportunities too. And then skilling up. Let's be ready to work with our new audiences. And this is a link to UK Coaching. They have a wonderful um, variety of classes there. So, um, so the links, so hopefully that will help. And of course the ACA are able to help promote our initiatives. And more importantly, they can write letters of support for us as we venture on into funding and building programs and working together. So I hope that gives everybody a little flavor of what's happening in New York. We need new committee members now that I'm, I'm stepping off. This has been a six year adventure. It will continue. Change is measured in decades. We're at year six, so four to go, hopefully with some funds to make it all happen. And I can't thank you all enough. I look forward to hearing all of what you're doing. Robert's gonna go next. And, um, and then Andrew's gonna see us through the rest of the time. I'm gonna be here answering questions. We're going to get a Q&A fact sheet together, which you will have hopefully by the end of the week. So thank you all so, so very much. I will stop sharing now and uh, over to you, Robert. Robert, I think you're still muted. You're right, I am. I had a little technical issue. Just one moment, please. Andrea, when you get a chance, be sure and read the comments. You're getting lots of love from the gang. Okay, Robert, I'm just gonna remind you, we're trying to get through our presentations by, by like 11, so we have time to, to talk about way forward. And I know that we've left you in it with a bit of a lurch. Thank you so much for being willing to present your stewardship stuff. Can you see my screen? Yes, you are good. Okay, great. So um, uh, I'm Robert Levin. I'm the state director for uh, the state of New Mexico. And I was wondering if, if I was hoping anyway, that most of you would have been able to see Norm Guam's um, presentation yesterday in the policy and stewardship section. And the reason I, I, had, um, I had posted that on Facebook for you to see, it would be really difficult for me to put into just a few introductory slides all the work that went on on those two policy issues. But here I'm going to give it a shot. Um, the one policy issue was the Kilo River, um, it was America's first wilderness area. Um, the policy issue had to do with um, uh, development projects for water. This was a really long protracted action. Um, and um, water development there was actually not feasible for a variety of reasons. Uh, I believe there were around $60 million spent on delusional studies with nothing to show for it, as Norm pointed out yesterday. Most recently, these water development projects has, have been shelved and um, the Gila River is now up for wild and scenic status. Um, it's a beautiful area of our state in the uh, southwestern corner. Um, our next policy issue that really hit the fan was um, stream access. Um, and this is the privatization of public waterways. It's important to, to uh, understand a difference in the state of New Mexico from other states. Um, other states where you're looking at um, uh, navigability issues um, through the Commerce Act, um, all waters of the state of New Mexico belong to the public according to our state's constitution. So we're a little bit different from other locations in that regard. Uh, and there's a big, big push here 
by very, very wealthy out-of-state landowners to privatize certain sections of New Mexico's rivers. Um, it's a lot of Texas oil and gas money that's involved in this in this process. Um, and um, ACA became involved in 2015 when they passed um, a Senate bill in our state legislature to allow for the rule change of our game and fish department to do this privatization. Um, and we brought it up as a state policy issue um, in, I believe, 2016. Uh, Norm Guam has been leading up this effort. Norm's on the call today um, and um, been, been doing a fantastic job. Um, but out of this, and the, the focus of, um, of my talk today is um, uh, about coalitions and partnerships. Um, in the particular stream access fight, um, there was a coalition that formed as litigation partners, and this is in litigation right now, um, where they were able to find a pro bono constitutional attorney uh, and there's currently a writ of mandamus that now resides with the Mexi New Mexico Supreme Court. Um, and that basically is saying, is this legal in the first place according to our constitution? That's the decision that's up before that. The three litigation partners are the Adobe Whitewater Club of New Mexico, which is, by the way, one of our only uh, paddling clubs in the state, the New Mexico Wildlife Federation, and um, backcountry hunters and anglers. Um, and as far as coalitions and partnerships, I wanted to point out our beautiful state logo for our ACA um, organization here, which encompasses the Zia symbol. Um, we, um, as an offshoot of the um, stream access issue, there was a uh, coalition and partnership that formed up. Um, and it's called the New Mexico Paddlers Coalition. Uh, the ACA is involved with a number of members, um, as is the Adobe Whitewater Club, the New Mexico uh, River Outfitters Association, um, which is primarily our rafting, um, our rafting group for whitewater and other trips, joined in, as did American Whitewater. And as you probably know, American Whitewater is laser focused more on um, these types of issues, where we um, in ACA are a little broader in our scope and mission. Um, the New Mexico Paddlers Coalition uh, is focusing right now on uh, maintain and influence access to rivers and waterways uh, to promote and support education conservation and stewardship initiative, and also focus on outdoor ethics. Um, I think it's um, uh, important to mention that this group meets currently weekly uh, to discuss current and ongoing issues. And New Mexico currently has an, um, a lot of access problems that seem to be popping up and we are under attack from extraordinary use by people who have never been outdoors before and who have, haven't the least idea of what outdoor ethics are about. Um, and there's a lot of trash, uh, a lot of things that are going on in our outdoor spaces that we've never seen before. Um, there's a little bit of a war going on on who is the best steward. The private landowners say they are. Um, the public is having a problem with it. And the governmental management agencies are um, uh, having issues with it as well. And we're kind of looking at that, um, that little piece um, where we all have a common interest in stewardship and conservation. And through that, we've been able to partner with a number of organizations, and that's growing. Um, we've approached the uh, Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, who controls access to a number of rivers, and Ducks Unlimited, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, and others. 
Um, our partners are growing. Um, every opportunity I have, I will approach another organization that has a similar conservation motive and ask them to partner up with us. And I have yet to be turned down. Um, and what that gives us is it gives ACA um, exposure um, and relevance in this conservation space. And um, it's a turnaround for, it's a win-win for everybody um, that's involved in the stewardship, stewardship and education partnerships. But I have to point out that stewardship cannot be just about picking up trash. There has to be an educational component where we reach other organizations and people. Now, in this particular slide, there was a quick um, stewardship initiative that was put together by backcountry hunters and anglers. But um, the partners that were involved in this, uh, including the ACA, uh, made it possible that we had the largest turnout for a stewardship event I have ever seen. Now, in looking at extraordinary use, now, it's granted, I did stage that photograph, but um, the um, ACA bags you see there are the ones I filled from that immediate area. Now, there's a large area at this access point on the river, and it all looked like this. Um, the, and oh, by the way, there's no alcoholic beverages involved, uh, allowed at this location. What do you know? Um, so we are currently experiencing extraordinary use of our outdoor spaces, whether it's in campgrounds or on the river. I recently went to Black Canyon below the Hoover Dam, and there's an area there known as Emerald Cave. Um, there was a lineup of about 70 boats waiting to get there two minutes in there. Um, our efforts have to be more than cleaning up trash. It has to be. Um, education, leadership needs to be the focus on the outdoor ethics. Um, whether it's leave no trace, pack it in, pack it out, we've got to be able to reach these people. And somebody pointed out to me that we have partners in REI and, and places such as that uh, that are all behind our stewardship. And my comment was, well, these people don't shop at REI, they shop at Walmart. Um, and those are the ones we really need to reach. Um, and I have this, this, this is my statement, that the access we enjoy today um, may be gone in the future, depending on how we approach conservation, stewardship, and education. And that's all I have. Okay, Robert, thank you so much. That um, that was awesome. You're getting lots of love too, by the way. <laughs> now I'm trying to go back to share screen. And Okay, I'm going to talk about the survey for a few minutes. Because I think what you guys are going to see is that there's some real common themes. We are all dealing with the same stuff, you guys. Um, and we may each have a slightly different approach as to what we do about it. But we are dealing with very common issues. And it should not be that hard for us to figure out something we can join forces on. I'm just telling you. I've, I've looked at these survey results um, until the wee hours last night just to make sure I wasn't missing anything. And, and we're, we're dealing with the same kinds of things here. Um, we had 18 responses out of 45 state directors, uh, plus all the other statewide offices that were all also invited to participate. Guys, I'm going to tell you, I, you know, early in my career, in my broken road of a career, um, I spent a little time at a polling agency. But my take on that, uh, 18 responses out of 45, we all know the state director program has had, has had some low energy this last year, right? I would have liked to have gotten 100 responses out of 45 state directors plus their cabinets um, and we got 18. So I'm very, very excited. I feel like these 18 people are the true believers 
and if you're one of them, and I think I see a lot of you are, thank you very much for participating. Um, but I also feel like we can, we, we've got more energy than this. We're just, we're just tired. <laughs> And, and tired is legit, okay? <laughs> but we, we've got more energy than this and we can all come together and we can do better. We can amplify some of this. Um, if we look at the hours of volunteer time that you guys put in that survey that you do, and of course some people say I do four hours a week, some people said I do four hours a month, some people put it in how many hours they do annually. Well, I sat down and multiplied it all out. I multiplied out what you guys said. And what you guys said is that every single one of us is putting somewhere between say 50 and 780 hours a year volunteer time into the paddling community and for the 16 respondents to that question alone that's almost 4,000 hours of volunteer time now i want you to imagine for just a second what andrea valancourt alder could do with that number where she's writing a proposal to get funding matching for those volunteer hours she could go make a pitch for funding based on our volunteer time that would get us money to go amplify these efforts exponentially. Um, the skills that you guys told us you have, we got five people that said they're good at marketing, five that said government relations, nine that said writing and editing, seven that said researching, four that said fundraising and development that I immediately put on speed dial in my phone, uh, 14 who are instructors, two that can do accounting and finance, six that are good at social media, one who's a healthcare professional that can help us with COVID procedure stuff. We got somebody within our own people, within our True Believer State Director Punch that can help us with COVID stuff, guys. Um, three that are good with technology, web, and apps, three that have environmental expertise, and then other write-in answers. We had networking, strategic partnerships, stewardship coalitions, conservation to leave no trace, and legislative legal support for paddlers. All of this is, these are skills, y'all. These are skills that we can use to support each other. Uh, if we look at this survey of what are the initiatives already happening, and, and I will apologize, I will take responsibility for any mistakes that I made by not putting verbatims in here. You guys will, will appreciate that I was trying to keep it concise. Um, in Oklahoma, they're already offering an Essentials of River Paddling class for new paddlers. In Massachusetts, they've got an Ocean Guardian initiative to promote environmental awareness. In Maryland, uh, advocating for paddler access to public waterways when local landowners are blocking access. In Missouri, they've got a winter paddling clinic that they've been working on. In Indiana, they created the Indiana Paddle Association uh, with youth leadership and Boy Scouts training. Um, in California, they developed the Heroes of Paddling Awards, California Safe Boating Day engagement and paddle green events. In Puerto Rico, they established a program using the ACA green bags for trash cleanup and then making art with the collected trash. Uh, in Rhode Island, they've been working on water trails, partnering with environmental groups and working on grants. Uh, in Nebraska, they've been instructing the Nebraska Game and Parks employees, some of that train the trainer kind of rationale, y'all, and then partnering with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Uh, and you've already seen at very wordy length what I've been working on in Tennessee, what uh, Robert's been working on in New Mexico, what Andrea has been working on in New York, because this is just a smattering of what's already happening out there. We could pick any one of these initiatives almost at random and we could work on it together and we could amplify stuff across the country and we'd be doing good work. We'd be doing great stuff that would be leaving a legacy with our paddling community. So Andrea, can I just stop it? We're getting a number of folks who never received the survey. So shall we send it again? I'll be happy to send it again. Um, I sent it in email twice and I sent it in the state directors group twice. Uh, so what I would say to that, you guys, I love you. I love you. Check your messages. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, would, we could find, we would love to have those extra hours, folks. It's Absolutely. But, but call your mom and check your messages. That's my, <laughs> that's my PSA for the day. All right. So the themes that we saw, we asked you guys what your safety hotspots and training opportunities were. And this was just a quick little survey monkey question, you guys. You guys know where the problems are in your states. This is not a question of knowing what needs to be done. Um, every single person came up with themes that are along these lines. Areas with casual paddlers, outfitters, and tubers that have little safety training. Environmental awareness and leave no trace ethics for new users. Need access to more ITs that came up two or three different places. 
and user group dynamics between paddlers, fishing, and boating. 95% um, of the answers that you guys gave to this question fit in one of those themes. I'm gonna say that when we get back together and decide what initiatives we wanna work on this year, it's probably gonna be on one of these. Uh, yeah, Mike, you've, you've raised your hand, go ahead. I was just trying to find out if Oklahoma was on. There was a lady last night from Oklahoma City that really needed some help. And uh, <laughs> I wasn't really sure what to tell her. So uh, if Oklahoma's on, if you could reach out afterwards, I'll, I'll brief you up. Thanks. Cool. Okay, so uh, safety hotspots and training opportunities. Oklahoma, they wanna work on whitewater policy management at Broken Bow Spillway, offer some quick start classes. Uh, and then market the ACA at the Whitewater Park. In Vermont, they want to train staff at Paddle Sports Outfitters and rental liveries and offer summer training at the hot spots where the, where, where the tourists are going, right? Where, like Champlain and Waterbury Re Reservoir. Um, Massachusetts wants to offer training for seasonal visitors. Maryland wants to do training for wreck paddlers on Chesapeake Bay that are not outfitted appropriately for, for open water paddling and then training for kayak anglers. Uh, this didn't come up as often in the survey, but I certainly hear it happening, uh, coming up more and more often that people are turning to our ACA safety instructors to help the kayak angling population. Um, in Missouri, they want an awareness campaign for life jackets on the Merrimack, um, some safe paddling on big rivers, from the Mississippi and the Missouri, and intro to whitewater on the St. Francis. In Rhode Island, they need paddling safety in Narragansett Bay. Again, the same question of right paddlers in open water, right? Uh, and user group interaction, coast interaction among paddling, fishing, and boating. In New Mexico, y'all talked about wanting some basic, basic safety for casual paddlers and teaching river stewardship. Uh, in Tennessee, We've had 26 swift water rescues that I know of so far this year on a stretch of flat water class one that would make most of y'all laugh. <laughs> so it's, uh, we, we, we've got a lot of places with outfitters uh, and casual users, but very little training that could use some attention. Uh, in Nebraska, they've talked about uh, safety training and environmental awareness. Uh, in New York, uh, talked about the, the the three places where there's a lot of wreck paddlers that are not appropriate, not trained and equipped appropriately to the conditions and not being advised appropriately to the conditions. Uh, in California and in Montana, they talk specifically about needing some more, more ITs to be able to meet the instructor demand. Um, guys, these are things we can, we can join forces on this kind of stuff. I mean, even if you just take into account that we're all volunteers, we all have a day job, we all have a state that we need to, to, to work and do our own issues. If we pick two issues a year, two deliverables a year that we were gonna join forces on, we could seriously move the style. Um, I asked the question in the survey on diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, because I've had a hard time finding success stories in paddle sports in my state. And what I found is that you guys have too. Uh, we see a lot of people that are talking about adaptive paddling. We talk about um, the, 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 the growth and the strength that we have found with female paddlers and building the female paddling uh, instructor base. Um, there's some work happening in urban communities. There's some work happening with, with uh, native tribes and the Latino population. Um, but, but largely we haven't cracked the nut on this one yet and I'll tell you my, my, my gut instinct my gut instinct when we look at what the national initiative is going to require to be successful in diversity uh, equity and inclusion I think what it's going to require is us I think it's going to require us to figure out some pilot projects at the local level and to be able to come up with some success stories that can be replicated and amplified and Right now, I don't think we've got it, but I think it's something we need to keep on our radar and figure out how we can have those pilot projects that are gonna make a difference for the country. Um, okay, so it is 11.06. I have almost made my timeline and I'm here ready to talk about this proposal for the way forward. Um, and I wanna start opening this up to, to conversation with all of us. So I would invite you guys, 
um, to as appropriate as we go along to un unmute your camera and your microphone because now's the time that we want to start having conversation. Um, the proposal has been made that we could form a leadership council. We could elect a chair, a vice chair, a secretary, and a treasurer. We could lead national and multi-state initiatives that we support and that we staff amongst ourselves. Um, we can do fundraising and development specifically for our initiatives, and we can support each other to grow training initiatives and awareness campaigns. Um, some of the other ideas, in addition to that proposal that were put out for in the, in the survey, uh, we could formalize the roles and expectations of state directors. We could come up with a standard marketing materials toolkit to promote ACA trainings, raise awareness about the ACA and recruit members. We could um, help support regional partnerships with like-minded organizations doing like-minded training. Uh, we could come up with standard messaging of about the paddling and ACA impact for each state, the statistics that make our arguments more persuasive about how many ACA members or how many paddlers do you have in, in every state? What are the safety statistics? What are the dollars spent in paddle sports? What's the impact on a community uh, when you have an outfitter on a river uh, economically? That, that could be a project we could take on. Uh, one state director offered to trade training. Uh, they were willing to trade wilderness first aid and leave no trace training to get some paddling and rescue training. So you figure if we've got 14 instructors here, we could be trading services amongst ourselves and improving our own qualifications to go out and, and be good advocates. Um, we could do river stewardship initiatives. Uh, we could support each other to grow training initiatives and awareness campaigns and collaboration among the regional clubs to amplify the impact in the region. So sort of like I did in Tennessee where we do a collaboration among all the clubs in the state. Um, you can do the same thing regionally. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna leave Andrea's and my contact information um, up on the screen while we have a conversation. And I, I want you guys to talk now. I mean, we've got from now until 11.45 when we have to adjourn. The only thing we got to figure out between now and then is when we're going to meet next. So y'all, y'all start talking and tell me what you think about these proposals and these ideas and what you would like to do going forward. Don't all jump at once. Come on. <laughs> There's some really good things coming up in the chat, by the way. Awesome. I will open my chat because I have been sharing my screen and not looking at my chat. I, I believe Amy mentioned something about forwarding of state director email. Um, and that seems to be a, a little piece on not checking your state director email account. I would just like to add that I added the state director account to my smartphone and it just pops up as another as another piece. Um, I don't have to keep logging into it or anything else. It just pops up notifications and there's no forwarding required. And when my term ends, I can just delete the account. Yep, I did the exact same thing. It makes it so simple. Yes, and you can set it up to forward to your personal account, but if you do that, then when your term ends, you have to remember to unforward it before you step away because the next person needs to use that account and it continues to go to your personal email and I don't have a way to undo that on my end, so just keep that in mind. You're welcome to do that, to forward it though. Jerry, did you want to jump in? Yeah, so can you um, explain the proposals again briefly? Sure, the formal proposal that's been uh, put forth, there's one formal proposal and then there's a, well, hang on. Let me pull it back up. Okay, so the formal proposal that's been made is that we would form a state director leadership council um, that could be our combined voice to the organization and our, our galvanizing force to, to schedule meetings and to keep us moving on, on, on an action plan, right? 
um, that we would elect a chair, a vice chair, a secretary, and a treasurer. Uh, we would need to decide how we want to do that, if that's something we want to do now or wait till elections. I mean, I'm totally open to how you guys think is the right way to set this up. Um, that within that, with, with that leadership, right, we would determine a couple of initiatives a year uh, that could either be national or multi-state that we would support and staff amongst ourselves, that we would collaborate among the state directors and the resources we bring to the table. Um, to, to try to drive an awareness campaign or standard marketing initiatives or training initiatives or whatever we decide the topics ought to be. Um, and that once we kind of get our legs under us and figure out what that looks like and how that's structured, we could put together funding proposals like Andrea is talking about, where we could actually go and get funding for our regional and multi-state initiative to do training, to do awareness, to do different things. Um, you know, we're, we're, we've got 14 instructors that we know of in this group. We've got the skills to do things. <laughs> gotcha. Um, you know, my initial thought, I think that's a great proposal. Um, and I wonder, like, what's the legal structures of each ACA state entity? Well, it's not. It's not a legal structure, is it? Right. No, we're all just a chapter of a national organization, and we would still be a chapter of a national organization. Yeah, and, and so it would still need to be what would what would functionally happen if we go for funding is um, ideally it would run as a pilot project uh, or a regional project through the ACA National, right? Um, alternatively, if for some reason that is not appropriate we could run it through one of the nonprofit clubs or organizations that we partner with. Yeah. And like one thing I was thinking, and I thought this before, and I said, it's a Chris deck before is if there could be some kind of formal legal structure for these ACA state chapters, because, so I worked for the nature conservancy out of college for the nature conservancy is, you know, an international nonprofit, then there's a state chapter. So I was donor community outreach coordinator for the Kentucky chapter. So it's its own entity registered with the state of Kentucky. But then it also sends money up and support to WOE, which is the World Home Office. And I, I think like that could, that could help. Um, or if there is some way to, for the ACA to create a formal fiscal sponsorship program, because there's a lot of grants out there that you know states and individuals could apply for, um, but they don't have like a fiscal fiscal sponsor. And not every state has like a robust organization, you know, like y'all do in Tennessee. Um, so I just think yeah. that that ACA structure, you know, could be used in that way. I don't know. I, totally, I agree with the direction that you're heading with the, with the thinking, Jerry. I think that that's right on track target in terms of trying to figure out the right way to run funding through the organization so we can do some regional projects. Um, I would hesitate to try to set up a legal structure since we are all transient volunteers in some way. Um, but I think that we could easily go to the board with a proposal for how we think grants ought to run through the regions. May I add something to that conversation? Sure. We, uh, the folks in California have had, have applied for and received grants through, um, I think it's SV, SV, B, SV something bank. It's a bank that one of them works for and they have received this grant they didn't get it last year i don't think they even applied for it but they ask us for you know all of the 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 information the financial information and the tax information and anything that you would need to fill out those applications you can get that information from us we'll provide it to you you, and you can send that application in and apply for these grants. The money comes into this office, but we know it's your state's money. As you need it, you let us know and we either pay that vendor or whomever directly, which is ideal. Then we don't have to send checks here, there and everywhere. We just go straight to that vendor or in situations where you have to pay immediately, we send you the reimbursement. So those are options, and it's worked really well in California. And I, and I think, Jerry, in terms of just the way it would work on a day-to-day -day basis and what would make it different now from what has happened, say, for example, the past year, right, 
if we have a leadership structure, then we don't have 45 state directors going to the, the seven people in an office in Fredericksburg asking them to do this, right? We have one person going to the office in Fredericksburg, hopefully asking for this for two initiatives a year that, are, that, are, that we are collaborating on, right? And yeah, if we, get, if we get all feisty and ambitious, we may end up with a few extra initiatives, right? But that ends up being like five times we go to the seven people in Fredericksburg and ask for this help, as opposed to 45 directors all going and asking for it individually and creating complete chaos. Hey, Andrew. So this is... Mm -hmm. It looks like Trey wants to jump in. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Trey, the chairman of our SEIC council, if it, what he wanted to add, and then I'm gonna go to Merida. So I was gonna I was gonna say, are are you guys for this leadership council? Is it going to be an amendment to the ACA bylaws? Um, we certainly want to do this the right way, and if that's the way to do it, we can do that. Um, we right now, what we're trying to figure out is how do we get our state directors engaged and active. Okay, so a couple things to to add. Uh, to, to the planning and kind of problem solving. One, any formal committee, council, board, or group uh, under the ACA uh, has to have 20% representation uh, from engaged or elite athletes. That's part of the Ted Stevens Acts. And as long as we're the NGB, any formalized group has to at least attempt to have that and to be able to show the USOPC uh, that they've made a good faith attempt. So all of our FCIC, elections, discipline committees, instructional committee, curriculum committee, all those things, even though they're not remotely competition focused, um, every year we have to reach out to the uh, competition members um, to clarify what the Congress, the Congressional Act says, are those athletes and, and what like that. So that's like, if you guys and, formalize that. And I'll that, tell you, that's uh, the number one argument I hear for keeping it an informal, uh, informal council. Right, and the other thing is to is to look at some type of operating procedure so that it wouldn't be independent bylaws, um, but you can look at the different associate the, the kind of groups that we have that help provide governance. Um, so you know who who is electing who? You know what what qual is it all members or is, is it a subset of the members? Um, as the ACD continues to grow, uh, representation um, to the different member segments and how all that works, and to provide some type of uh, equity or at least um, equal access um, is kind of a, a big part of it. So just as, as you think about what this looks like, it's not just what it is, but how does it stay what it needs to be and what are those mechanisms year in and year out so that you're not spending all your time governing the group, you're spending all your time creating work. Um, and we've been able to do that at SEIC over the past five years, whereas for a long time we spent all of our time on governance and we finally simplified our governance so it took a two to three year effort, and now we're able to focus on getting things done because we have these plans in place that help us make decisions when different people leave or resign or move or get elected to new positions. Uh, that domino effect is, is already figured out for us. Um, so uh, happy to be a resource um, as you guys troubleshoot this and problem solve it to kind of cherry pick what works for you guys um, from you know the the pain points that other people have figured out the hard way. Learn, learn from our mistakes. Thank you, Trey. Appreciate that very, very much. So, um, yep. Can, can you, am I through? Um, so, Trey, thank you for that. Uh, there are many creative ways that we can collaborate. We don't have to set up officially, formally, but we can set up our own partnership with a partnership agreement. There are a number of policies that are very easy to just put in ACA number, you know, the logo there to change it up and also job descriptions, folks. What are we all doing? So we're not going off piste and we're rogue everywhere, but there are very practical, very easy ways to do this. We do this with community development projects um, because there's a whole lot of behind the scenes that work that needs to happen, especially with partnerships and making sure there are no hidden agendas. We've got to agree our focus of how we can move forward with that. But, um, there, there are wonderful solutions. We've got, we know what a lot of the problems are, but I wonder, Andrea, if we should set up the date today with the folks who are online here uh, for the future conversations. So just throwing it out there. Well, Meredith had already put her hand up. Um, so I'm gonna, we, we still got 20 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna let Meredith go next and, and then we'll continue and, and we'll leave time so we make sure we set up the date for the next meeting. Go Thank you. 
Thank you. No worries. I was in the middle of cooking while we were doing this, so no worries. Um, so I'm Meredith Waters with the kind of DC metro area. Um, and one, we've always kind of been a little quiet, not quiet on our side, but we haven't had strong until recently, yay, Maryland. Um, I haven't had like super strong um, Maryland attention, so I love it. Um, and our Virginia side, so I've kind of had to cover that area. Um, I do have a question because I've kind of been around since um, the beginning of the state director program and, and such. And so I've watched it kind of ebb and flow throughout the, the years and such. And I know too that the funding for the individual state directors, like chapters, has also, do we have an update on the funding that is allowed for our state directors now? Uh, I feel like we're kind of in the dark about kind of what um, we have as resources now with the major shifts and everything um, within the ACA state director program. Yeah, and I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Amy say that answer that officially. But let me tell you what I'm expecting Amy to say, so that we won't all, we can all set our expectations and not be surprised. Um, with COVID, all of the insurance revenue tanked because there were no events, right? And people were not recertifying, so and they were not uh, renewing their memberships, and so an awful lot of the revenue tanked. So I'm going to say that what I expect Amy to say is that right now that $500 allotment per state is in question until we figure out the, the overall organizational revenue stream. Um, I certainly am not expecting any money in my state right now. Um, Amy, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys to give an official answer, but I just wanted to, from a state director, set an expectation that I'm not expecting money right now. <laughs> and I'm not going to contradict that statement. Um, unfortunately, on top of a year where we reduced our membership dues and which drastically affected our um, income and then we had COVID immediately afterwards on top of again another year of low income I mean low membership dues um, we do not have the funding and we also you know don't have the manpower we this is the smallest staff we've had since I've been at the ACA um, so unfortunately, right now, we just don't have the ability to provide financial support and staff support at the level that we have in the past. I will do whatever I can to help you guys as much as I can, but it's not going to be at the level that you've had me in the past. But as soon as we can support this group, I promise you, this is very important to us. And we do see incredible value in this, this program. So hang so here's in there. What say, you guys. Here, here's what I want to say. If we join forces, and let's, let's keep it simple, right? Let's say two initiatives a year. Let's say we come up with an awareness initiative and a training initiative, hypothetically. I don't know what we're going to come up with, right? But let's say we come up with an awareness initiative and a training initiative, and we're going to join forces on two initiatives a year. And we put, up, put our heads together, we put our hours together, our blood, sweat, and tears together, we bring, up, bring in some private funding, and we start bringing money in for our two initiatives a year, and we start getting publicity for our two initiatives a year, and we start moving the dial on training across the country in our two initiatives a year, right? I guarantee you the board of directors of this organization is going to start giving us money if we're bringing in money. <laughs> if we're moving the dial, if we are the thing that is making this organization grow and change and be relevant, then we're going to get a budget. Right now, you know, the, it, it's hard to split pennies. So let's not talk about pennies. Let's grow the pie. Let's grow the pie for everybody. Let's make a difference. I can't see if there are other people trying to talk. So just cut me off. Can, is it all right now? Um, folks, so with our with funding, with all of this, ACA is a not-for-profit organization. So we need to really grasp a hold of that. There's a whole lot of money out there in the environmental chat, the stewardship chat yesterday. I think I heard 900K being batted around. But by working together, joining initiatives, so we've got environment, holistic programming, we can get a whole lot of cash. And right now, we're focusing on Dixon Cabela's and Bass Pro. There is a grant out there with Bass Pro and Cabela's, 10000 a pot. 
rolling program, which is phenomenal. But if we apply together as a team, we can get more funds. Rather, my concern is people competing for the same funds. If we have a strong program, we can roll out at our own little individual pieces to it. Um, and so to Trey's point, we do not have to be a formal thing. We can be a group. We have the formal structure of the ACA. We have not for profit status. It is all right there. We don't need to reinvent. We need to band together and, uh, and really make it happen. We're successful here getting funds. I think by working together better, we can get more and we can achieve our goals. I know Mike, our, our state director, Last time we ran in, we were involved in an event together, I just asked her, how much does he spend on gas, on travel, on accommodation? Over four grand. I think we looked at our volunteer hours. If we look at how out of pocket we all are, we're funding the ACA. We need to turn the table <laughs> there. Well, it's true, folks. I'm, I, I'm not being rude, but we, we are all worked so very hard. So let's now turn it around and get the ACA status to help lever some funds for us because it is there. It is, there's a lot available and we just need to be creative. So thank you. Yeah, my, my um, um, oh, sorry. Were we supposed to raise hands? I'm so sorry. No, go for it, Jerry, go for it. Yeah, my, my concern is, you know, always like coming from, and, and I do like a lot of work in the Southeast and my background is in environmental science and uh, working with like uh, marginalized communities. My concern is like for rural rural states and stuff, or states where it's you know there's not a lot of resources. So like Kentucky, i.e., you know, like we're one of the poorest states in the country, and um, you know, whereas like New York, I know for sure I'm not picking on New York, but New York has resources, but also like a paddle sports like uh, legacy. You know, like I'm heavily into racing, and I know that there's like the ACA is popping up there. I also know the USCA is popping up there. So it's like, you know, how can we, it, I, I like what y'all are talking about, um, but I'm like, if there can be some templates of, of, of things on um, grants to, I, I don't know. I just think I'm excited for more of the conversations on this, but I just worry about some of the states that have uh, not an established ACA presence um, being left behind. And that's what I see. Like whenever I join the ACA state director program, um, my state director was, he's like the, um, the former one. He was, uh, owner of the biggest canoe livery in Kentucky and I didn't get anything. <laughs> no notes, no, like, here's what we were doing. No, nothing. So like, I'm like, what do I do? Like, you know, like besides what I'm already doing, you know? So like, there's no, I'm, there's no foundation. And I, I feel like there's, there's stuff like that in other states that I've talked to as well. And that's like my a big concern. Yeah, I didn't I didn't get a good turnover either, Jerry. I mean, it was I was taken over mid year actually for our former state director who had some health issues, uh, and I got about a twenty minute phone call where he hit a couple highlights and there wasn't much turnover happening. Right, um, I think that pretty much in our own way, probably every state director is going to tell a similar story, that in some ways they they had to make it up as they go along, and now we're at a place where we figured out that the way that we can be successful individually is to collaborate and be successful together, right? And so now we need to figure out, instead of just trying to, 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 to recreate the wheel in every state, how can we build that foundation you're talking about so that when the next generation of state directors come in, we can give them a foundation. So folks, one of the things I think we really can do is we can set up maybe some lunchtime trainings. The work we did in the UK was with all the groups you can imagine and language was a massive barrier. I don't speak Urdu. We had a lot of refugees. I mean, the hardest to reach faith groups. Um, so we actually have, I brought all that stuff back from the UK. We have templates for how to engage. We have a lot of templates on funding and being creative. Um, so perhaps we could consider having a session where we just look at the kinds of things we can do. And Kentucky, I just, First time ever explored it, land between the lakes. I would love to come back down there. And, uh, and I see a lot of opportunity there too, working with the motor boaters and think outside the box. We've got, we know the environment and, and what we do is connected, surely. But then, you know, who, who else can we bring into this? Me, I keep thinking Dixon Cabela's and all those guys, but it might be the local bakery. 
you know, it might be a local philanthropist you've never met before wants to, that's how we funded our APW actually. So, so there is so much conversation that can happen. We do have the resources and tools that we can share out with you so that you can start. But no, it takes time. Please don't get frustrated, folks. This is, as I said, we've been hitting this for six years here and we're just, our presentation is actually what we're gonna be putting out to the funders. So I hope that helps a little bit. We want this to be fun. We wanna to learn together and grow together and, uh, and, and just help where we can. Um, Mike Cavanaugh has raised his hand. Uh, Mike, why don't you go ahead and talk and, and, and then if, once you finish, I think what I would like to do uh, is come up with our action items and our next meeting date. Okay, uh, this probably would fall into your action items. One of the things that I would uh, be uh, concerned about is that uh, we follow all the guidelines or uh, precepts of the um, state director program. So I don't know where we stand on things like elections. Are, are we really official people since we haven't done anything in a year and a half or so? Or, you know, uh, things like that that might uh, address some of the points that um, Trey mentioned in terms of you know making sure we're legitimate. Well, I'm legitimate. I don't know about you, I've been working my tail off. <laughs> hey, Mike, Mike Schillinger, am I the state director in Tennessee? Oh yes, my mistress. <laughs> I am your evil minion. I will do whatever you do. <laughs> direct <laughs> one thing but you know what, i if, if i may say something though i i do think that was a is a valid question because there was a, about a year that we had no idea we were getting no feedback from um aca we weren't getting our emails responses recognized we weren't getting anything and so like that kind of basically told us like aca you know if you had the ability to, to keep things moving, that's great. But also too, no one knew if it was alive or dead. Yeah. I'll speak to that. Oh, we have, we have the big guy, Robin. Yeah. Um, Andrea, let me speak to that for a moment. I would um, love for you to. Sure. When the state director program was developed six or seven years ago, it was intended to help replace kind of non-functioning divisional level um, the state director program is interesting because it is not written into ACA bylaws. Uh, it was developed as an entirely staff driven program and that gave the, the leadership a lot of flexibility in terms of how it was run. It also meant that it started or stopped at any point. Um, and, and it, clearly we don't want to stop it. At this point, you know, kind of regardless of where we were in the past, we'd like to move forward with it and really get people involved. And anyone that is currently in the position and is willing to do the job, we're willing to work with. Um, and you know, part of that working with is moving forward, trying to develop more resources, uh, putting on more pro programs like what you guys are doing right now. Uh, I've been listening and I really appreciate all the work that you were doing. And you know, I'd, I'd love to see the templates that you've suggested come out. Uh, but as Amy has mentioned, we've got a very small national staff and we really depend on the volunteers to, to step up and you know, share these resources, which will allow us to create more resources to help you do what you're doing already. I hope that, that kind of clarifies the history here. And Amy, I see you're shaking your head, thank you. Okay, hey guys, this is Lily Colby. Um, I'm going to back up Robin here. Um, I s serve on the board. Um, and this has been a really eye opening discussion. Um, frankly, I think it's been the best thing I've heard since the conference has started. I've been in all the different sessions. And I hear you. Thank you, all of you guys. My God, your volunteer work is I'm blown away and um, this session is being recorded this will get out there and I'm really interested to see the presentation to try to get funding this is where it starts guys and um, you know a year ago in Richmond I saw the state directors have this little cluster of stand-up meeting after the final meeting does it was are people remember that moment 
And that moment blew me away to see people standing up in that little basement trying to go, we got to do something. I feel like you've moved the needle from that little stand-up meeting in that basement last year to where you are today. So I congratulate you and I encourage you. I know you're tired, but please keep going. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. I really appreciate getting that, that kind of backup from the board level. So thank you, thank you, thank you both. Um, guys, we're all we're all a little tired. We all would love to have someone tell us the right thing to do to go lead. But guess what? We're 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 leaders. And we were elected to be leaders. People in our state know that we're leaders and they know we got this. They know we can do this. Um, so let's let's talk about the next step, okay? Let's talk about when we're gonna have the next conversation like this one. And let's talk about what are the documents and tools and, and things that you need to prepare for that meeting, right? Um, obviously, we'll make all our slides available. Um, it sounds like we may need some sort of, of documents from uh, Amy that, that talks about if there are any parameters on what we're allowed to do or not do or what our job descriptions are. Whatever those formal documents are, we need to see those. Uh, and then we need to figure out how do we want to structure our own ongoing conversations. Um, and is it a, a monthly Zoom call that we do on a Sunday evening so it doesn't interfere with paddling? <laughs> and, and we figure out like what's the next step? What's the next baby step we can take? What are the two initiatives a year we're going to focus on? And how can we all collaborate? Um, how can we how can we join forces and have five pilot programs that are doing safety training for new boaters or environmental awareness and leave no trace for new boaters, whichever we decide is the right thing to do, right? And we could, I mean, guys, we could go after a Coast Guard grant for that. I mean, we could go after Gates Foundation money for that. We could go after all kinds of different foundation money that would bring resources that Jerry doesn't have available locally in Kentucky, but because we're doing a five location pilot program with a national organization that has national standards for training that we can get that funding and we can go make a difference and then once we prove success or we show the thing that didn't work and we know what not to replicate we can do that more of that the year after i mean we can really make a difference here um, and and all it takes is that for all of these go-getters that are doing these programs in their states by themselves and collaborating with the, the folks in their local stakeholder groups to just collaborate with each other across the country. And, you know, we got Zoom, man. With Zoom, we can do anything, right? <laughs> so, and in the meantime, folks, can you gather your figures for us? How many rescues, how many recoveries in your area and what craft? Because that will, we need evidence to uh, approach the big box stores to, to lever that funding. And it's gonna be a, a challenge. We have got uh, locally, our lead on the Hamburg Water Rescue Unit, he and I will be going in with a presentation and really trying to, to bring that home. The more statistics we have, the evidence, the facts, we can't turn away. I'd be very, um, very interested to see it, how much we could possibly leave or share out regionally, north, south, east, west, probably the best way to go. And I would encourage everybody, let's pilot it this year. Join us on May 22nd, run a free event. Ours is a drive-through safety check because we don't know where we're going to be with the pandemic. Our rescues, our firemen and our Coast Guard, you know, we'll all be masked up. They come through with their boats most likely in the car. All our outfitters are there. Then they can learn and get to know who. And then we're going to run clinics on land. You don't have to have water anywhere near. And part of reaching out to our hardly reach, take the boats out to a rural environment, sit on a mountaintop and learn how to brace or, or you know, do your hip flick. I call it belly okay, dancing. So, so guys, we're down to our last five minutes. So rather than get bogged down in what the proposals ought to be for which initiative we ought to do next year, let's focus on when we want to meet and what you need between now and then to have a good meeting, okay? Um, I personally, I work nights. So nights are hard for me to meet. So if you want me to be there, <laughs> <laughs> I'm good on Sundays. Sundays are really good times for me to meet. Um, I can also do weekday mornings, but that's usually not good for most other people because they have actual jobs, right? So let's figure out when we want to meet. What are you guys, what are your constraints? Um, we could do a doodle poll to kind of help organize that. Um, and then also maybe another idea is um, to me around that poll again. 
Um, now that it is all on our radar, um, I think you may get a, some additional responses, including mine. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> Okay, guys, are you okay if I if I focus on the state director's Facebook group as a way to communicate with you for quick hits, or do we need to do something different? Could you open up the state director's Facebook page to all your committee members because um, we need information flow? I only just joined, so felt very disconnected for the last couple of years from everybody else. So is that possible to extend the membership to that group so it's not so closed? I can do that. Yeah, it's by invitation only, but I can do that. Okay, so Amy will invite the, the, your full cabinet. Anybody who holds a statewide ACA role uh, is gonna be invited to the Facebook group. And then is the Facebook group an okay way for me to give you that poll link and to, to share things that are quick hits? I, I like the Facebook group I, idea. This is Rob. Are, are there any of you guys that are not, that are just absolutely anti, completely opposed, don't have a Facebook account, will never see anything in Facebook that we're going to miss that we know that we have to email you personally? Mike Gray, Mike, hi Mike, uh, says he doesn't use the state director Facebook page. Does anyone? And we don't well, have- Well, but that's the point. Here. We're going to use it. The question is, are, are you against using it? <laughs> So the Facebook page used to be when it was originally started, it had a lot of, of business and work on it, which was great. Um, and so I think maybe we just need to get back in the practice of it. It was also a great resource of program ideas. Um, you know, the directors would be like, hey, I need a, a new non-boring stewardship idea. I need, you know, how better to frame picking up trash on the side of the river um, and things like that. So it, it's, a, it's a great resource. And with having Facebook kind of, instead of having all of these other tools that are great tools, um, what you can do with Facebook now is also create chat rooms within that Facebook. So if there's a particular thread or a working group that you know needs a little space to, to operate, Facebook now groups has that too. Um, and so that way we're not having to go back between you know, a gazillion different um, platforms. Yeah, and I also like that we're not having to I do better with a thread than I do with multiple email accounts <laughs> and reply alls. Okay. All right. So it sounds like, sounds like we're good. We're good with the, with the strategy of going with the Facebook group. I'm going to re-put the poll out there. Amy's going to get us our official documents. Everybody's going to do what they can to start gathering your stats. You're not, we're not going to punish you if you don't have it all the, like the first day. It's a process. It's an ongoing process trying to get that data. But do what you can to get what's easily and readily available. Um, are you all okay if I, if I schedule our next meeting for a Sunday evening? Is that okay? Does that work for you all? Um, Michael Gray suggested a doodle poll on that. I'm good with Sunday, but... Um, I, you know, we've done doodle polls in the past and they've been very helpful. Uh, is, it, I'm not as familiar with doodle. Is that something that we can do in the Facebook group or do we need to do that through email? Mer Meredith can do that, I think. Is that what you're offering here? <laughs> yes, I'll set up a, a doodle um, and I'll put the link on the Facebook page. Awesome. I just, I just, my goal is to have that meeting between now and Christmas. Okay. Not All right, what else do you guys need from us to inform your conversation about how we would structure this group at that meeting so that we can make a decision at that meeting about structuring that group and moving forward? Hey, Andrea, this is Carrie from the office. Uh, we need to start wrapping up. So just, just a few minutes warning. Yep, thank you. So I think we can put together, Andrew, maybe we put together an agenda for the meeting. Everybody can contribute to that and that gives us a focus um, so that we don't go off piece too much um, with some, some housekeeping things like job descriptions and everybody agree what we want to achieve and, uh, and then take it from there. Um, I think I've only got a few months left, so grab me while you can. In the meantime, I will get the templates together for you, clean them up, change the British language, and I'll... Um, I guess send them to Amy to send it. I don't know. Uh, we'll work out the, the delivery mechanism, but um, they're useful toolkits uh, to engage in with our diverse communities. So, 
Thank you all so much for being a part of this today. Andrea, if you think you only have a few months left, you're very mistaken. <laughs> I've been telling her that for months. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Amy and Carrie, we'll turn it over to you guys and we'll, we'll go join the member meeting. Okay, just wanna let everyone know that the recording and um, slides, everything will be posted on the ACA homepage under the what's new section. So if you wanna come back to this, listen to it again, look at any of the slides, you will have access to this. Thank you everyone, this is great. Thanks everyone. Hey, thanks everyone. It was good to good to check in with all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.